Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state. Uh, we do presentations, interviews, book reviews, uh, little mini training sessions sometimes, um, anything that we can come up with. Uh, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, and they are recorded, so if you're unable to attend here with us live on Wednesday mornings, that's no problem. You can watch any of the now going on three years worth of, um, A lot of, stuff. of Encompass Lives that you can watch all of our topics. Um, this morning, we have um, Michael Sowers sitting next to me here who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And once a month, he comes on our Sh Encompass Live show and does his monthly Tech Talk, um, mm -hmm. where he does interviews um, and uh, with some pe people sometimes, and then just whatever interesting techie has come up since the last time. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> nothing ever happens in tech. Nothing. <laughs> Gosh, I hope not. <laughs> if, if, if that starts happening, you're, you're out of <coughs> You're out of a show. No, it's job security. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to hand over to Michael to talk about right. to introduce us to what we're doing this morning. All right. Um, well, today is going to be um, kind of back to how we really started these tech talks with with an interview. Uh, no real presentation today. We're going to have a discussion with uh, Lauren Smedley from the Fayetteville Free Library. And Lauren, are you there? I am. Hi. Yay. Well, good morning to you. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, and, and people who have you know, signed up kind of got an idea of what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump right in here. Um, where is the Fayetteville Free Library? We are located um, about 20 minutes um, outside of Syracuse in the suburbs, uh, okay. so central New York. Great. Yeah, didn't want anybody to think you were in Arkansas. So. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> um, the other Fayetteville. The other Fayetteville. Well, what's funny is when I first saw it, I was I thought it was Arkansas. So I figured we do we just we just clear that up. Um, I'm originally from Rochester, New York, not Minnesota. So uh, there you go. And I'm from Saratoga Springs. We're both New Yorkers transplanted. Oh, right down the street. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Um, before we kind of get into the topic at hand, um, could I get you to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, what, what's your background? Um, how'd you get into librarianship? And um, other than the particular topic we'll get to, what, what, what's your position there at the library? I am the Transliteracy Development Director uh, here at the library, and um, I actually graduated from Syracuse University with my master's degree um, in August, so a fairly new graduate. Um, and I, I always knew I wanted to get into the library world, but after I graduated from uh, my undergrad experience, I wanted a few years to uh, work and, you know, before I went back to school. So. Um, I always knew I would get here. It just took me a few years to get back in the game, but here I am. <laughs> Great. Now, um, uh, boy, I, I've forgotten the date already, but somewhat, somewhat around a year ago, um, I remember reading an article in Make Magazine talking, ah, yes. Yes, yeah, talk, talking about the future of libraries. Uh, I'll admit I didn't buy the magazine. I'm sure I read it online. Somebody pointed me to it, but... Um, and the, the author of that article, and we'll link to it in, in the show notes, was suggesting that maybe libraries, instead of being uh, just housers of books, maybe they create spaces where people can actually physically create things. And from what I can tell, you probably saw that article too, and took it kind of to heart. <laughs> You know, what's actually interesting is that um, that article came out um, when I was still in school and I was taking a class called Innovation in Public Libraries. And we had talked about 3D printers and sort of these types of labs and been pondering should that be in a public library before this article came out. And then once it did, it sort of solidified everything for me that, you know, yeah, I do think this should be in here, and I'm going to write a proposal and present it to um, the director at the library where I work and go from there. So it did have a rather large impact. I don't agree with everything he says, but some of it I do. 
Well, in fact, I just saw another article kind of in response to what you've done that said maybe libraries are in the right place. Maybe it should be, you know, Kinko's. Um, so, you know, hey, I'll go with libraries. Um, okay, so you wrote this proposal. What, what, what was in this proposal? What, what is it you were saying that your library should be doing? Well, I sort of titled it as um, a community collaboration catalyst, so a way to bring the community in to exchange knowledge in this new way. Um, and what was in it was a budget plan, a proposal, why we should do it, um, pluses and minuses, um, you know, straight down to what grants I wanted to write um, to get funding for it, um, where we were going to get the equipment. Um, it was actually pretty comprehensive, and um, you know, I, I walked through it step by step with uh, the director here at the Fayetteville Free Library, Sue Considine, and she said, "Let's do it," and off we went. Okay, so let's get a little specific because not necessarily everybody listening to this knows um, exactly what we're talking about when we say things like fab labs and maker spaces and whatever. So, with, in in not getting into the specifics of exactly what you've done yet. How do you describe a fab lab or a makerspace, or what, what is it we're actually talking about here? Well, in our library, fab labs are traditionally um, associated with MIT. That's where they were first created. And when MIT talks about a fab lab, they're saying a fabrication lab that has very um, sort of structured equipment. Like if, if you have a fab lab that's tied to MIT, it has the exact same equipment no matter what lab you're in. And we started on that model, um, but because of a few safety concerns and some other things, we aren't going to be able to have exactly the same tools that a traditional fab lab would have. So we are sort of moving in the direction of it's going to be a fabulous laboratory that's more closely associated with a makerspace. Um, and a makerspace and hackerspace could be, you know, sort of um, synonymous, but makerspaces are generally more um, based in the education, children-y kind of world as opposed to a group of adults coming together to hack all the time. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up here the, the, um, the Fab Lab page from your website. Um, sure. So one other thing, uh, one other question I had, and, and I mean, I, I'll admit I know the answer to this, but your your library is kind of in a unique building, as, as I we have are. it? We are. Yep. Uh, this library used to be um, the Stickley Furniture Factory um, way back in the day. And it, it's a cool place to be because people used to make things here, you know, and we're giving them the opportunity to make things here again. So it's, it's really coming full circle. Great. I know. Um, my... my um, Parents definitely said they were going to be listening to this afterwards. They they are quite fans of Stickley Furniture and have been to your library. Uh, um, and the, you know, oh there's wow! A, there, there's a Stickley Museum upstairs. Is that correct? There is indeed. Yes. Yeah, so, Open on yeah. Tuesdays and Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So you've you've got a basement, and what have you done to it? Well, it's actually the Fab Lab's not going to be in the basement. Um, it's oh. the east wing. Okay. The library is about um, 72,000 square feet, and part of that's taken up with the museum upstairs, and then the main library, um, everything has been developed but this east wing. And the plan is we, we just submitted a grant and have first round approval from the New York State Construction Library Fund um, to renovate this space. And we're going to turn it into a business center and a fabulous laboratory. So what 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 are the plans? What's what's going to go in? I mean, uh, we'll, we'll we'll get some money eventually. I'm sure in this conversation, but um, sure. what, what what are you envisioning is going to go in here? Well, as far as the um, fabulous laboratory is concerned, we already have one MakerBot, and we're putting in an order actually today. Very exciting for our second MakerBot. The first, um, which is a 3D printer, in case you don't know um, what that is, and um, our first MakerBot was donated by a local computer store, and the second one is through another donation. So we're quite lucky. And on top of 3D printers, we plan to have laser cutters, um, CNC machines like a CNC router. Um, I'm trying to write a grant right now for a Mac lab. We have a PC lab here in the library, but I want to make sure that we're um, offering access to both. And um, 
really after those initial um, machines are in, we're going to sort of work with the community and, and develop as we go, seeing what technology they need. All right, so let's look, let's talk about 3D printers. Um, for, for folks who aren't on the call who, who may not have heard of those, I can, I can tell you I want a MakerBot. I, I keep asking for one for Christmas. I don't, th <laughs> I, I don't think I'll be lucky this year, but um, what, what the heck is a MakerBot? What's a 3D printer? Okay, well, um, a MakerBot, if you get it unassembled, which unless you're very tech savvy, I would recommend you buying it fully assembled, as I learned the hard way, um, it costs about $1,200 unassembled, $2,500 assembled. So they're not cost prohibitive um, in that regard. And what it is, if you imagine a regular printer that is hook up to, hooked up to your computer on your desk, it's about the same size, and it hooks up to your computer with a USB cord, and instead of a print cartridge um, moving back and forth across the piece of paper, what it's doing is feeding, it feeds this roll of plastic. It um, kind of looks like a big ball of, or roll of string, if, if you will. And that string feeds into the printer. And so instead of printing in ink, it's printing um, in uh, plastic. And it builds in an additive process a 3D object. So if you have a child at your library who wants to build his own superhero, you can either go on a couple websites and download the design, or you can help them design it themselves. You hit print, and out comes a plastic superhero. Or a robot, as you see on your screen now. <laughs> so so let, me, uh, let me ask this question. What, what have you made with it so far? I'm assuming you had to try it out, I, I'm, I'm guessing. We're still um, messing with some of the electronics, um, so it's not up and running yet. Um, but I have a long list of things to print that we are um, going to be in the next couple of days. I've been working with Tim Brower, uh, who's a professor at Syracuse University um, in their design works lab, who's been helping me assemble it. and the. Z axis and the Y axis are moving, but the X axis is not. So we are trying to fix whatever that problem is. So sadly, I haven't made anything yet. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that's maker bot. That that sounds like a significant problem unless you want to make something really thin. <laughs> um, so, exactly. Well, where 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 would you get? I mean, I have enough trouble designing a document which is in two D. Um, <laughs> How the heck do you design something in, in 3D? What, where, where, where does that come from? How, how does that work? Sure. Well, there's a couple different options. Um, if you have absolutely fear, absolute fear of designing something on your own, you can go to a site like um, Thingiverse, which um, has open source um, designs that someone else has created. So say you want to build a doorknob. Uh, on your MakerBot, but you don't know how to design a doorknob, you go to this website, type in doorknob, and up it'll come, and you can print it out. But if you want to design your own 3D object, um, there are a couple free options like Google SketchUp, and then they have um, some that are, you know, you purchase the software like Blender or an AutoCAD type of program. Okay, great. Um, and. I mean, I'm unfortunately not taking as good as notes as I thought. Besides the 3D printer, did you say something about a laser cutter? Some some of the other equipment That's you'll have? That's in the cards. That's in the cards. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We so, are just... Oh, go on. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know what I was going to say. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> laser cutter in the cards. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we're uh, fundraising right now. Um, to get the money to buy the laser cutter, and we're hoping that it will have it um, in the next three or four months. Okay. And you, you the thing, something called a laser cutter makes me think back to something you already said about um, safety issues. Um, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you start getting, uh, okay, in a traditional library, probably the worst thing, you know, catastrophe you can think of happening is maybe a, a, a shelf of books falling on somebody. <laughs> Um, and right. you know, there's 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 going to be some you know insurance involved uh, with the library, but you you start getting things like laser cutters, um, you know, which I'm I'm assuming are relatively safe, anyways. But you know, I I like to think of the worst here. Um, is 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 putting in equipment like this going to affect larger issues with the library, such as I don't know, you know, insurance, um, who's allowed to use it. 
that sort of thing? Is, is, is any of that um, something you're starting to deal with? Um, it's it's something that we're starting to think about, but most of these machines, for example, a laser cutter, it has um, this big hood that closes on it, um, so it's not something that you can injure yourself on. Um, the laser doesn't run until the hood is closed, um, and it's going. There's going to be a librarian supervising in the space when it's open at all times. Um, and as far as insurance purposes and and things like that, that's um, the director's field that I don't really. Uh, get involved in much, but with the technology we're going to have in um, at the moment, it's not an issue yet. Okay, great. Um, so that's all yeah, I know about I, that. The executive director's handling all of that. Oh yeah, well, no, that's wonderful, and and you know, obviously, it sounds like you have a, a lot of support from 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 the folks above you, and and that that's that's a really great thing. What? Um, Obviously, you're you're looking at getting grants and things like that, and you have a, do, a donation of of a maker bot already, which is is phenomenal. What overall? What sort of budget are you looking at to accomplish this whole thing? I mean, what 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 what's the money involved here? That we're talking about. Well, we're sort of raising, you know, whatever funds we can. I mean, it's possible to run a program like this in your library if all you can afford is a maker bot. You know, so at this point, we um, did win um, an award at the Contact Summit, which was a conference in New York City that Douglas Rushkoff, uh, who is an author and media theorist, put on in October. So we won a $10,000 innovation award there. And right now, we have a campaign going on Indiegogo.com, uh, which is a open crowdsource funding site. Um, and we've raised um, just about four, well, thirteen thousand four hundred and eighty or something like that dollars um, today. So we're going that route. And really, the more funds that we raise, the more we're going to be able to purchase the construction grant that I spoke about earlier. Um, that we haven't received final approval for, but we got first round. We're pretty sure this is going to happen. Was for two hundred fifty one thousand dollars, and that's just to renovate. Um, the East Wing. It's not to purchase any equipment. Um, as I'm sure many of um, the folks listening who are in the library world know, it's hard to find funds to renovate um, space. It's, it's easy to find grant money for programs, you know, to run things, but um, the construction's the hardest piece. So we're, we're lucky that we're moving forward, hopefully, with that. And what has the public reaction been thus far? I'm, I'm going to assume good, but, you know, you never know. Um, I mean, you, have, you obviously have you know, the backup of your director. I'm assuming the library board uh, is in on it. Um, but how about, you know, other government entities, the general public? Uh, what sort of reaction have you been getting to these plans? We're in the very... Um developing stages of, of some of this. So it's been a really grassroots, um, organic development of support where um, Tim Brower, who I mentioned a while ago, he's a professor at SU, but he lives here in the village. And he has um, a number of friends who are very tech savvy and interested in making, uh, who have also come into the library to help set things up. And um, so word is really spreading. Um, just by people who are interested in the project, um, through people who are making donations and, and out, you know, really across the world. We've received donations from as far away as Sweden, which is kind of awesome. Um, and everyone at this point seems very supportive. I think there is some confusion, um, you know, for people who aren't um, really involved in the maker techie kind of world as to what exactly is a 3D printer. Um, but once people understand, you know, everyone's getting on board and getting really excited. You know, to know that your child could walk into the library and learn how to design something on 3D software, learn to program computers, create video games, you know, it's, they're important skills to learn, and I think everyone's really excited that this will all be available for free. Yeah, I want to take a road trip. <laughs> 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 next time we're home. Yeah, ne ne next yeah. time we're back east, um, you know, you'll be out there uh, sooner than I will. Um, here, uh, here's maybe a, a larger issue question. Um, there, there's been discussion in, in the kind of the library blogosphere and articles and stuff about kind of curation versus creation, and 
you're you're obviously definitely moving into the the creation space. That that's the, really the point of this. Um, do you foresee the library then having any sort of role in then curating what it is that your patrons are creating? Is or is it just hey, here's the space. It's the library. That's great. You had fun, and and now you're done. And please come back sometime. Well, I think it will be um, sort of mixed, at least in the beginning. Um, I certainly hope that eventually this community develops sort of like the maker community in the library, and it becomes um, sort of self-sufficient. And it's a part of the library, so it will follow sort of standard library policies and, and procedures. Um, but as far as creating what people are curating what people make or, or directing in that way, I, I don't think so. You know, we plan to offer, we consider this a service, in essence, of the library. So we'll offer, you know, an introduction to digital fabrication class and then, you know, open up the machines and the computer lab that will be there so that people can mess around and play with it and build what they will. Great. Yeah, no, a ser service makes sense. Question? I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking along the lines of maybe in in either maybe in it, man, maybe it's just an encouragement to submit to somewhere like Thingiverse but you know, encouraging people to uh, share their designs that they've created in the library. Obviously you can't make them. I, I I wouldn't necessarily suggest that, but but possibly say, "Hey, um, you know, you've created something here in the library. You did the design work. Maybe you you you'd care to share that. Maybe that's something we could even set up something to do. I, I'm not trying to create work for you here. I'm just kind of <laughs> kind of kind of think about the larger issue. Well, well, the reason I thought of it is is at our state conference uh, a month ago, we had Jamie LaRue from Colorado out, and he's talking about um, setting up his own uh, ebook uh, distribution service at the library and cataloging and curating local authors in, in ebook formats. So I'm just thinking instead of local authors in your situation, you kind of have local designers quite possibly, and that's something maybe uh, uh, an additional service that the library could, could uh, create. Absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting is Neil Gershenfeld, who uh, is the director of MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, he wrote a book called Fab, The Coming Revolution on Your Desktop, From Personal Computers to Personal Fabrication. And in that book, he talks about um, one of the things that really developed when he started creating these fabrication labs that they were not surprised, but um, heartened to see is that there's this peer-to-peer -peer training and sharing model that has developed where if you have someone working on the MakerBot who can't quite figure out how to turn that corner in a certain way, that there's someone down the row working on the laser cutter who mastered that skill. So he comes and shares that, and then perhaps the other person helps with the laser cutter. So it becomes this environment of sharing and, and training each other that we're hoping to be able to encourage, um, particularly with some of our, our younger patrons who we're hoping will use the service. Um, for example, if we teach a young woman how to solder um, on an electronic component, that she's then responsible for training, uh, you know, 10 more people. And once she does that, perhaps she gets a little um, soldering prize or package or something. So we have plans to sort of encourage that, um, that sharing model um, from the very beginning stages. Um, are you familiar with the website Geek Merit Badges? That 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 just made me think of that. Here you can you know earn a badge for soldering or, or teaching no. somebody else the. Um, I don't think they have that one, but they 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 can do custom ones, they can do custom ones yeah. too. You might want to. It's, it's, I think it's geek, geekmeritbadges.com. For example, I have the 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 family tech support merit badge. It's a piece of pie and a pair of handcuffs. <laughs> I love. So. I'm sure I will look into that. Thank you. Many, yeah, many, many people on the call, I'm sure, can 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 relate to to that one. Um, we, going back to to equipment and costs, um, one of the other things I thought of is is, for example, with a 3D printer, you you have to buy the the plastic that goes that goes into it or whatever the material is. Where where do you draw the line between what the library or or what are your plans, anyways? Um, between drawing the line between what, what the library will supply and, and what the patron would have to supply to, to use the equipment and create what they're trying to create? Sure. We have purchased um, a fairly large quantity of plastic at this point um, through some of this grant money. And 
you know, as we don't know how much plastic is going, our community is going to use at this point, it's hard to fully predict what the model will be. But I have um, a general plan, which is our printing service right now that we do for our patrons, is the first five pages you print are free, and after that it's 10 cents a page. So I imagine that the plastic will follow a similar model where the first X number of ounces are free, and after that it's a certain number of cents um, you know, per ounce in order to sort of mitigate some of the expense, but it won't be to raise funds for the library. It'll be purely to cover the cost of, of the plastic. Oh, sure, that makes we, sense. We're going to try to keep it as, as free and open as possible. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I always like that. <laughs> and, and, of course, obviously, <laughs> the, the, the actual, you know, use is, is going to be an issue. And I, I like the model. I was thinking in, in measuring it in feet, but ounces, I think, probably, probably works, too. Um, in, in sort of the long run. Um, kind of the, the, the last kind of big question I have, and, and you know, anything else you want to share with us, we'll, we'll appreciate, but you've been getting a lot of press. I mean, we, you know, I called you up last week and was like, hey, can you, can you come talk to us? And poking around and, and the, the links we found, I mean, it looks like you've been interviewed by Forbes magazine even. Um, yes. What, what, I, I can I assume that this level of response has been a bit of a surprise? And, and how, how's that been going? <laughs> it really was quite shocking. We, um, Audrey Waters from MindShift um, interviewed uh, me a couple weeks ago, and that's really where the deluge sort of started <laughs> um, of press. And it did happen all at once. And it's really, it's really exciting. We're, we're thrilled that the word's getting out there. I've had a number of librarians from across the country um, reaching out to me to say, oh, this is an awesome idea. How can we do it? Or we've gotten this far. What are you doing about this? Um, you know, so it's really generated this community of support as well as um, a place to exchange ideas and, and to help other libraries start thinking about creating this in their own space. So the press has been um, really exciting. Uh, most of it's very supportive, and it's been a great way to connect with other librarians who have similar ideas. Cool. Um, and and at this point, I want to remind everybody on the call that you know we're more than happy to take your questions. Just go ahead and type them into the the questions area, or you can raise your hand. We can turn on your microphone. Uh, have one question. Oh, we do have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, well, it, well, yeah. or we we have a question from the audience. Yeah. Um, it's actually Kieran Hickson from Colorado State Library. Hi, Kieran. Um, <laughs> hey. He wants to know if the proposal that you put together is available online for people to look at as a reference. Is there somewhere that people can see your proposal? Sure. It's actually, um, I'm working on writing, um, in essence, a white paper that will include my proposal, it will include our budget, it will include um, our mistakes and, and what went right. Um, so it will be. It's not yet, um, but it's something I am actively working on because from the very beginning of developing this project idea, it's been a mission of mine to make sure that other libraries can, um, you know, recreate this in some way um, on their own. So we are all about sharing, and it will be up as soon as I can finish writing it all. <laughs> and, and, in, and, in to, and in anticipation of that white paper, I guess kind of the, the, the last official question I have, and unless you say something that makes me think of another one, is what, okay, so I'm a library, I want to do this. What, what is the core advice you would give me if I wanted to try to pull off something like this? Number one, I would say make sure, you know, that, that you are ready to learn how to use the stuff yourself. Um, I think it's important um, that everyone in the library who would be helping patrons understands the technology and how it works. Um, and making sure that you have community support. I mean, right from the very beginning when it was just an idea, I had a local computer store, you know, saying, yes, let us help. We want to help you with this. Um, so building that community support is very key. And um, not being afraid to take the risk. It, it, it's not as big of a risk as you think. It really makes sense to line up these kind of services with traditional library services. We have computer labs. This is sort of an extension of that. Okay, and you said something that made me think of another question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, your, <laughs> your, yeah. <laughs> Well, your your statement about you know making sure that that staff is going to be able to use this stuff and, and learn it. I've been doing a lot of just 
workshops on on e-readers lately, and you know you're you're getting libraries with different staff members have kind of a different levels of comfort, but the support for those um, or, or the the requests for support from the public are there. So we're kind of saying, look, you've got to learn this. What um, I, I don't necessarily want you to like you know point out that you you've got a coworker that just hates this idea, but I mean it, the rest of the staff at the library are any of them kind of going wait a minute I'm going to have to learn how to use what to to help the patrons or is anybody kind of nervous about this because this is a whole other level of technology from just you know say an e-reader or or surfing the web. Sure, I mean I think that. It if the librarian is certainly really uncomfortable with it, then they don't necessarily have to be um, helping the patrons run the machines, but being knowledgeable on what they are and what they can do. Um, in case the patron comes up to the reference desk and says, I heard you have a MakerBot, what is it? You know, so that level of comfort, I think, is essential across the board. And our librarians here, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky to work with the group that I have here. Everyone is you know, really on the cutting edge of innovation and supportive of new technology and advancements. Um, and I'm sure that there'll be some librarians who want to get their hands dirty and make things and others who, you know, are, are perhaps not interested in making something but just think it's a cool idea. So um, it, it depends on, on the librarians and, and who you plan to have running the machines. If there's someone in the room facilitating, then I think they probably should have a knowledge of at least how to press go and print. Um, but the more knowledge they have, the, the better um, you can facilitate the, the service. And it's really, what's interesting about, um, you know, these, these types of machines and makerspaces everywhere is that there's, it's a spirit of this beginner's mind, you know, that um, it's okay to make mistakes and to print something that looks like a big blob because you didn't um, make a coordinate exactly correct, and then you learn how to fix it. So. Um, you know, nobody has to be an expert as long as you know how to, uh, the basics, I guess. Yeah, you, you, you said printing out the blob, and I, I just suddenly flashed back to, you know, printing out the resume where one line is on that last piece of paper and just, you know, having to do it all <laughs> exactly. over again. And, you know, maybe maybe the, the, it's, it's just a different problem, but ultimately it's the same problem. It, it's just learning how to do it and, and, and learning how to adjust. Sure. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, yeah, someone oh, just great. did ask, um, for doing, making things with the MakerBot, are multiple colors possible? I assume they mean like in one item. Uh, or even separately. <laughs> well, you know, I haven't gotten that far yet, but I believe what you can do is you can make things with moving gears and different parts. So while I think if you're making a solid, and I could be wrong on this, so... Uh, but I think I'm right, that you can assemble different pieces of different colors. Um, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. I know that they make different colors and that you can print in different colors. I'm not sure if you can print in multiple colors at the same time. I think there's a special attachment that you can add to do that, but we don't have that. Yeah, I, I think in, in 3D printing, that's one of those like, you know, um, advanced features on a more expensive equipment sort of thing. Yeah. And, and the MakerBot being kind of your baseline equipment each piece has to be in a color, but you can, you know, put things together with multiple pieces. So that's exactly. It. Um, uh, one other question for you: There's a um, short video online from it was either a TED event or an Inspire event or something. With <laughs> it's it's like this ten year old kid talking about why he loves his 3D printer. Have you mm -hmm. seen this? Oh yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that kid is going to rule the world someday. I think I just you know, I I will recommend that awesome. to everybody. Um, just search YouTube for why I love my 3D printer and make sure that, they, that the speaker is about 10. Um, it's, it's a great short little video about 3D printing and what, what you can do with it. And fixing his mom's keychain, I seem to recall, was part of the uh, story there. So, Absolutely. Um, uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, that's one. Okay. If you do have any questions, there's a question section on your GoToWebinar interface. You can type in there, and I see the questions mm -hmm. here, and we can pass those on. Oh, here's one that, that pops in my head. What, what is um, the, the village you're in? What, what is your population served there? What, how, how big of a town are we talking about or village? I'm not, I'm not quite exactly sure on the size of the village, but our library is chartered to, chartered to serve just over um, 10,000 people. Okay. Great. We serve a lot more than that, according to our circulation statistics. But um, <laughs> according to the state, that's our that's our area. 
Gotcha. Okay. I, sure. I didn't have a question. I was just curious about. Um, now I know you from reading the articles that you got when you were in library school was when you came up with this proposal and and it become got hired at the library to do that to actually do this. Um, were you interested in this kind of thing, creating stuff, making things before Ooh. this, or at the same time, or was this did this just come from that class that you took, or did you already have an interest in this kind of building things? Um, just wondering for. Yeah. yeah, are you a crafter? <laughs> Maybe. This actually, um, this class, Innovation in Public Libraries, I uh, had two professors, Meg Backus and Tom Gokey, and, and this class um, really changed the course of my library school education. Um, it was really in this class that I started to think about some of these things. Um, I hadn't had much experience um, in this making world before then, um, and we read some books like Program or Be Programmed by Douglas Rushkoff and Fab, the Neil Gershenfeld book that I spoke about earlier. And, um, you know, it's from this class that it really has created this interest. Um, I'm taking a course uh, starting in January on digital fabrication and, and building these skills. So I'm not an expert. I'm learning. I'm a beginner. Um, but it is possible to do it even if you are a beginner like me. So just something that caught your attention and made you go, oh, hey, that sounds cool. <laughs> It, well, yeah, and I just, I really, I saw the, that there was a, a service here that we aren't offering, that there's such a gap. There's, you know, there's a digital access gap, and then there's also a gap to, access gap to this kind of, of technology. And, you know, libraries are really, you know, democracy engines, you know, if you want to go that far. And, and they represent free education, and this is, you know, a service that you can't get access to unless you are a member of something like a university or um, a hackerspace, you know, and I think it's important that we give the, the public as much access and free um, connection to this stuff as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. I'm not, not going to get an argument from us <laughs> on that one. <laughs> That's for darn sure. Um, no new questions. No new questions? No. All right. Lauren, I want to thank you so much for this. This is... Um, you know, um, first of all, the very short notice, I, I think I called you in the middle of last week um, on this, so oh, we're glad, glad, glad you were available for that. Um, what you're doing here is just, uh, like I said, I want to take a road trip, and I am not kidding. I, 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 I was you know, in talking to my folks. have you. Yeah, I mean, in, in talking to my folks last night, I'm just like, you know, hey, I've, I've got to get out there, and I have friends in Syracuse, too, so um, I think there, there's there's... I'm getting out there someday. <laughs> of course, I also have to take a road trip to Colorado Absolutely. for something else. So um, just appreciate it. Um, for those of you listening, uh, we will be linking to these different websites that we show. And we'll put all those in the show notes. Um, Lauren, they can contact you through the, the library website if they've got other questions, because I know you're not very busy at all. Um, you know, you're, you're happy Absolutely. to help. Yeah, well, let, let her write her white... Yeah, let her write the white paper first and then start calling her. We want her to get that done. Uh, we want to know how that goes and, and how other Absolutely. libraries can get started. So, um, again, thank you very much. No other questions have, have come in. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and put you back on mute. I've got just a couple other things I'm going to talk about to, to wrap up the show. Uh, you're, you're welcome to, to hang out for, for about five or ten more minutes here in that. Um, and just one last time, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and everything very, you're doing oh, thank out you. there. Very interesting. Oh, thanks so much. It was great speaking with you. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so what I usually like to do for um, at, at the during these text talks is just talk about a couple of other things that have come up uh, that might be of interest to our libraries. And I've only got just two or three uh, this week. Um, this list is... A short version of the list will have a much longer list in the um, show notes when, when we uh, post up the recording. But the, the first thing I want to mention, and this just happened two weeks ago, I know a couple of months ago I did a tech talk about Google+. Plus. Well, um, as soon as I actually sign into my account here, Google+, Plus has opened a new feature, so I just kind of want to give a, a slight update on that. As soon as I remember my password. Um, Google now has the ability to create pages for brands and businesses. So you can log into your Google Plus account at plus.google.com. 
Uh, there's probably a link in the bottom right, but then the, the full address is listed here on the screen, plus.google.com slash pages slash create. Um, in our case, we would be looking at creating one for a company, institution, or organization. Um, you can do that. There are some, uh, excuse the pun, pluses and minuses to, to how the system works right now. I, I did not intend to say that, Krista, sorry. I uh, gave her a little bit of a giggle there. But um, I have created two uh, based on my account right now. And if we look at my Google Plus page here as this loads up, what you'll see under my name in a moment, as soon as it decides to show up, it, okay, here it says also two pages. So what I've actually done is I have my Google Plus account, and then I have two pages that I've created, one of which is for the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, it's, it's still very new, like I said, about less than two weeks old. A lot of pages that are being created right now are basically being created just so that they're there. Not a lot of people have exactly figured out how to use these things yet. The single biggest downside is that I have created the Nebraska Library Commission page. I am the only one who can actually post to it because I'm the one who created it. So Chris has given me the eye over here like, what do you mean I can't post to it? They haven't gotten that far yet. So eventually you will be able to have multiple people contributing to a page for an institution or organization. But right now that is it. And there's no real way to feed in content automatically. So basically what I'm doing is when somebody writes something to our blog, I copy and paste the link into Google Plus and it shows up there. Like I said, very early, but just since a couple of Tech Talks ago, I talked about Google Plus and how this feature was not available. It is now, so just wanted to kind of give you all a heads up and maybe it's something that you want to take a look at. Um, the uh, other link I want to talk about real briefly here is just an interesting article I found from PC Magazine. Uh, that you may want to take a look at, especially if you are offering uh, Wi-Fi access in your library, which we all should be doing. And this is just a brief article about 10 ways to boost your wireless signal. Um, it's going to talk about some of the things such as, you know, don't put it up against the wall, uh, make sure it's not next to the elevator, that sort of thing. We've had the elevator problem here in our building oh, yeah. where, yeah, the antenna was too close to the elevator. Whenever the elevator went up and down, the, the signal dropped. Um, but there are other things. There are software, such as what's looking at here. You can change what's called the channel for what um, your Wi-Fi signal is on. There's actually, I think, 13 channels to pick from. And if the building next door is on channel 6 and you're also on channel 6, your signal will not be as strong. You might want to change to a different channel. So anyways, let you read the article um, just if you're having issues. Even if you're not having issues, actually, uh, might be a particularly uh, good article just to take a look at to see if you can improve the Wi-Fi access for There's your always... public. You always think, oh, it's fine because it's working, but having it work even better doesn't hurt. You know, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you. Boost, just, you. You might not realize. People might just not say anything about it, and then you do boost it, and all of a sudden you get the comments, hey, it's so much better now. Or, exactly. I never used it here because it was so bad. Mm -hmm. and I didn't, yeah. And, and yeah. I, just, I just boosted the signal in my house because the router was in the basement, and oh. upstairs it worked, but it was especially if you got further towards the other end of the house, the signal got really, really low. So I spent 30 bucks and got a Wi-Fi repeater, oh. uh, put it on the first floor of the house, and now the whole house is covered quite well. Uh, so, you know, different things that, that, that this article will talk about. Um, I believe I have one other one here I'm just going to bring up real quick. Um, this is a plug-in for Firefox that some of you may be interested in. Uh, it's uh, Priv3, the Firefox extension, Practical Third-Party Privacy for the Social Web. Uh, there's been a lot of articles lately about how um, things from Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter can track where you're going online, even if you're not on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. And what this plugin will allow you to do is have a little more control over uh, what level of tracking from these sorts of sites uh, actually do to you or not to you, depending on your settings. So just to, something else you might want to take a look at uh, real briefly if that is a topic that interests you. So um, that's all I've got this month. I think we're going to have a, a slightly short episode. Uh, have any questions Does anybody or have comments? Any questions? Is, yeah. You know, um, now, now's your chance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm here. I can answer a question. Lauren is still here. If you have questions about her Fab Lab or if you have any questions for Michael about what he talked about um, or anything techie that you wanted him to, to help you out with that he sure, yeah. that as well. <laughs> this is where we vamp for a minute or two to give people a chance <laughs> yeah. to type. Um, 
But uh, just for fun here, I'm going to go in and, and uh, back to this Wi-Fi article. Um, in fact, the first one here is, is talking about changing the channel. Um, yeah. And I've done that at my house. Uh, and then the next suggestion, oops, we can't find the page you are looking for. Um, so that's kind of a problem. Um, maybe this article suddenly isn't as good as I thought it was when I bookmarked it. Uh, change the channel. I'm going to try this one more time. Um, if this is really, really bad. Okay, I will go attempt to find some other article to replace this, I think, because I know there are others out there. Um, or possibly my URL is just bad, so I will work around that. Could be something wrong with their page at the moment. Yeah, Everybody. true. Could be temporary. So, all right. I think that's so it, it doesn't look like any questions have come in. Um, that's fine. You guys know where to find us to ask any questions. Where to find Michael? Um, Lauren's information is on the website for the library. We will be um, posting that in the links when we put up the recording of the session. It has been recorded. Um, Plan is to get up this afternoon because tomorrow's Thanksgiving and yes. we're out of here. <laughs> uh, commission, we are closed uh, Thursday and Friday for the holidays. So. And as we'll always, we do also uh, turn all of these into uh, our podcast. Mm -hmm. So um, there weren't a lot of visuals this time. Some of them work better as audio only than others. I think this one will work pretty darn well. Uh, yeah. uh, so we'll get that up as soon as possible also. Yeah. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Lauren. That was very cool. Oh, that was wonderful. I want a library here to do that. <laughs> Somewhere <laughs> near me, so I don't have to travel home to New York, which isn't a bad thing. Though. Um, so that will wrap it up for this week's Encompass Live, our monthly tech talk. Um, and we hope you join us next week when we will have uh, Marty McGee, who's from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, and Teresa Sullivan from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. <laughs> I somehow went to the completely wrong page. <laughs> All fails, good to go. There we go. There we are. <laughs> Anyhow, they will be with us next Wednesday to talk about Network of Care, a website of community-based resources um, for helping people, and definitely something libraries could use. They can go there if you've got people coming in asking you questions about health-related issues. Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to show off that website next uh, Wednesday morning. Yep. And I, I already have my interviewee scheduled for the next Tech Talk at the end oh, of December. Yes, sure, uh, I'm, I'm actually booked through January. It's yeah, it's right up there. Uh, we will be talking to Sarah Houghton uh, from the San Rafael Library in California, also known as the Librarian in Black. Um, she's She's got opinions, so I figured she'd be an interesting person to talk to, and we'll just... We'll leave it at that. We're going to cover lots of different things. So. That'll be at the end of December, December 28th, in between Christmas and New Year's. Yep. That's our Tech Talk. Um, so, and then you can see all of our other ones there. So, um, no new questions or anything or comments have come in. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's, that's it. it. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for attending. We'll see you next week. And uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.